Postcards from Beyond Written and narrated by Paul Harris Uses and Abuses of Mental Energy To understand the true nature of life requires us to establish a window of awareness in which we can mindfully investigate our immediate personal experience. To create, support and maintain this mental space requires a working understanding of another generally misunderstood and regularly misapplied mental factor, that of energy. In a list called the 37 Requisites of Enlightenment, energy is mentioned nine times. That's more than any other factor, including mindfulness itself. Energy is the factor of the mind that supports one's chosen endeavour and prevents its collapse, rather like new timbers that help to keep an old house up. One of the Buddha's monks, the Venerable Sonna, wanted to attain liberation and he worked extraordinarily hard, so hard that the path he used for walking meditation was covered in blood from his feet. By his own admission, he was one of the Buddha's more energetic students. But despite his supreme efforts, enlightenment eluded him. He became depressed and considered giving up and returning to lay life. Before ordaining, Sonna had been a musician and was skilled at playing the lute. Knowing this, Gotama guided him using an analogy of tightening strings on a lute. For it to be well tuned and easy to play, the strings must neither be too taut nor too lax. In the same way, if energy is applied too forcefully to develop mindfulness, it leads to pain and restlessness. If it's not applied enough, it leads nowhere. Learning to focus on a single object of contemplation such as the breath, teaches us all about the application of mental energy. We discover what is too much, what is too little, and eventually experience shows us the optimum level of energy required to keep the mind gently touching the object. This is not unique to meditation, of course. The artist, the musician, the athlete, the surgeon, they all need to learn about balancing effort as part of perfecting their disciplines. The bee also knows about balancing energy. Reach the flower too early and the pollen is not ready. Reach it too late and it's already gone. The wrong use of energy stems largely from our deep-rooted desire to avoid suffering. For instance, We live in a culture that praises maximum effort and we are taught from a very young age that success and happiness are the result of hard work. So there is a strong tendency towards what in Buddhism we call becoming. In other words, we work hard to fulfill a future goal that we ourselves have projected, believing that it will give us the happiness we seek. Conversely, it is also very common to develop a strong aversion to the suffering inherent in hard work and habitually tend towards peace and quiet through inaction and lassitude. There is a flip side to the lazy streak too, whereby we employ maximum effort to get rid of whatever is standing in our way so that we can get back to peace and quiet as quickly as possible. To a certain extent, these techniques must have worked, otherwise we would not have employed them so diligently. It's inevitable, therefore, that when we first begin to develop mindfulness, we approach the task with the same habitual tendencies. Typically, this means that when we begin the training, Our application of energy to support mindfulness 
is extraordinarily heavy-handed. What is actually needed is an exquisite and subtle balance. Put another way, we need to develop a really light touch. Imagine trying to keep hold of a little bird in your hand. Squeeze only slightly too hard and you will injure the bird, yet apply too little pressure and the bird escapes. The Buddha often advised his students to seize the object of contemplation with the eye of attention. Those who habitually use too much energy try to seize that object with all their might and use all their force in order to subjugate the mind to their will, just as they have in the external world. They are deeply habituated to the idea of a future goal and are used to employing maximum effort. The result of using such force to develop mindfulness is usually crushing headaches, extreme restlessness and agonising bodily tensions. For the habitually lazy-minded individual, seizing the object feels like incredibly hard work relative to their normal levels of application. Unwilling to really exert themselves, after a brief flirtation with the task at hand, they soon relapse towards a state of relative inaction and while away their time in daydream and sleep or find a reasonably untroubled mental space to settle down in for the duration. Inevitably, as happened to the venerable Sonna, when energy is wrongly used, frustration with the practice will grow and grow until a point is reached when one finally accepts the need to adapt one's approach. Sometimes, especially for the overachiever, the frustration can lead to a spontaneous letting go of all that striving and, suddenly, in place of the usually cramped, unwieldy and taut mind, there is peace, clarity and spaciousness. At such times, meditators often report how simple and effortless it all seems compared with their previous attempts at developing mindfulness. More usually, however, the lesson in how to use the right level of energy has to be learned and relearned many times until it becomes second nature. With his analogy of the lute, the Buddha is indicating that there is a balance to be struck, a middle way of energy, with forcefulness and laziness being the two extremes. To correct the imbalance, the meditator needs to adopt the approach of the other extreme. The idea being that, in doing so, they will pass through the area of optimal energy use and with enough experience will learn to recognise it. So the energetic worker learns how to restrain the habitual urge to force the pace. And, in contrast, the lazy bones learns to repeatedly exert firm effort to seize the object of contemplation and sustain their application. In practice, it's very difficult to appreciate what the optimal level of energy is compared with our normal habitual application. This is because the right balance feels so delightfully unhurried, effortless and simple. For instance, Consider the effort that's required to support your intention to listen to these words. You don't have to try hard at all, do you? And yet there is energy going into preventing your attention from drifting. You can apply the same principle to reading a book or taking in the fragrance of a flower. You require enough energy to simply support your endeavour but do not need to use any unnecessary, excessive force. It's this same level of effort that needs to be applied to watching mindfully and noting the arising and passing away of physical and mental events. 
Compared with its normal habits, however, to the lazy mind, this task will appear like an awful lot of hard work, and to the overly energetic mind, it will seem like being asked to do nothing at all. In both cases, there is an intense desire to revert to the status quo. After all, these habitual responses are deeply conditioned in during early childhood, and perhaps might even have their roots in past lifetimes. One student reported having visions of her parents standing over her, wagging their fingers at her, telling her she was wasting her time, as she sat in meditation, learning how to restrain the urge to force results. The ego will use any technique to maintain its dominance. Managing mental energy effectively requires intelligence. When using energy rightly, it has the delightful feel of working comfortably within one's upper limit. The meditation feels unhurried and the mind is spacious and zestful. It will not, of course, stay like that for long. Conditions are always changing and so the meditator needs to be flexible enough to adapt the amount of energy used in the course of a session. So, if mind or body begin to feel contracted or tight, the meditator learns to ease back and not put in any more volition to be mindful for a little while and wait for the results of the volitions already made to produce their effect. Conversely, if the mind begins to wander, the meditator then uses a little more energy in reapplying focused attention on the chosen object of contemplation. At this stage, it's a bit like riding a bicycle. It's not so much about trying to remain in balance as limiting the degree of imbalance by making tiny corrections as you go. Now encouragement, now exertion, now restraint. The key to success in the use of energy is clear comprehension of the overall objective. Freedom from suffering is not some future goal requiring an arduous slog to get there. Freedom from suffering comes from continued, mindful investigation of our immediate physical and mental experience. Energy needs to be applied only to the extent necessary to support that endeavour. Whenever one's energy does balance out, the mind becomes spacious, zestful and happy, and practising mindfulness becomes a joy.